right, so this is the second Media Work Quick talk uh, in this conference, and then I hope uh, it will be as informative as Lorenzo's uh, yesterday's talk. Um, I have been a streaming guy for a long time. I did some WebRTC before it was called WebRTC during, uh, when I was uh, a student during my PhD, but uh, since then I've been doing mostly streaming, and uh, I am probably the least WebRTC person in this room. And uh, so please don't beat me if I make uh, some bad jokes about WebRTC and WebRTC people. Uh, <laughs> there might be a couple of jokes in there. Um, so we are going to talk about uh, Dash. Uh, does everybody know what Dash is? Dash, Dynamic Adaptive Streaming over HTTP? OK, I can't really see you, but uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to explain in a couple of slides. So that's the de facto standard that we use for streaming today. Uh, better be it like YouTube, Netflix, uh, Disney Plus, or all kinds of OTT services. They are all using uh, more or less uh, Dash and HLS uh, type of uh, um, uh, streaming uh, protocol. HLS is Apple's version, HTTP live streaming. And Dash is an international standard developed by MPEG, which I am one of the co-chairs for. So we are uh, looking at MediaWorks Quake, which is a new developing uh, uh, spec in the IETF. It's just started in November 2022. So it's just, uh, you know, still not even two years old. And uh, the spec is still cooking. And uh, we have some early implementation, and we would like to see how well it compares to Dash. And, uh, and uh, you can also you know, make similar statements for HLS as well. So just a bit about myself. I come from Turkey. I'm originally from uh, Konya. I was raised uh, there, and I am currently living there. Uh, after 14 years in, uh, abroad, I came back, got married, and you know, I have a family there. I got my bachelor's in Ankara, uh, Bill Kent University. I did my PhD at Georgia Tech, and I did a year-long uh, internship at Qualcomm uh, in, uh, you know, when 3G was still being standardized. This was 2004. And then I worked for Cisco for about nine years, first in Bay Area, and then in Toronto, and then back in Turkey. And then I got married, as I said, because that was my, uh, you know, uh, lifelong goal. <laughs> um, you know, I had a big, fat Turkish wedding, uh, over 2,000 people. Uh, I barely know about uh, 200 of them. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I got, uh, you know, I, I had to leave Cisco because they had to, they asked me to come back. And, uh, my wife and I didn't want to move back, so I got a faculty position. And I've been doing some consulting business uh, since I joined the school as well. And then a couple of years ago, I got an Emmy Award uh, for my contributions to the Dash standard. So uh, Dash, or HTTP Adaptive Streaming in general, it also uh, is true for HLS. We have a source, live or on demand, doesn't really matter. Uh, in this case, let's talk about the live source. We have an encoding engine or transcoding engine that will uh, get this multi, you know, uh, single high bitrate uh, uh, content and then turn into multi bitrate uh, uh, content, and then we have a packaging process, which is a HLS packager or Dash packager, which will provide the you know uh, media segments uh, for streaming, and then all the, all also the manifest and the playlist uh, files uh, for uh, for distributing the content. Everything is put on an origin server, HTTP origin server, right? And then there could be an encryption process. Usually for premium content, we need to apply encryption. And then through a content delivery network, or by using multiple content delivery networks at the same time, we deliver the content to millions of devices. So when we talk about the HHLS scalability, we are talking at millions of devices simultaneously. So I know that WebRTC people would like to have that kind of scalability, but uh, you know, uh, that's the trade-off. We have a bit higher latency, but uh, we have a much uh, better scalability on the streaming side. So the, the delay, uh, from the uh, from the source all the way to the playback depends on a lot of things because a lot of stuff is happening, and uh, it's usually between uh, tens of uh, tens of seconds. But uh, with low latency extensions for the HHLS, uh, we can actually achieve around uh, you know uh, a couple of uh, seconds of latency from source to the playback. Uh, but those are not very common as of now. I mean, the standard has been there for a few years, but the services are still not there. 
there, there was a couple of uh, uh, content providers who actually streamed the European Championship this, this year, this summer, in low latency. It was just a couple of them in Europe and a couple of them in the US. So why we use HTTP, why we have adaptive streaming, these are all you know, listed here. It's damn cheap. You, know, you deliver a gigabyte of video over CDN, it is less than a cent. It doesn't really cost you too much to deliver the content. Now, when we look at the latency problem, first of all, we have two important metrics, startup delay and latency. Both are very important. Startup delay, as you can imagine, is really the delay. You click the press, you know, the play button, and then the content starts playing. Latency is how far, you know, how, be, how much behind you are from the live point. So they are not necessarily the same thing. Your startup delay might be too small, too short, but latency might be too large, or vice versa. Now, here I am showing an example where we, have, we are doing live encoding, and then we are generating four second segments, which is very typical. And, uh, you know, segment one, two, three, four, five, and then we are now at time equals to 18 seconds. So I just joined the football game. I would like to watch it. So there are a couple of options that I can do. My player can do what HLS, native HLS player, AV player does, fetch the last three available segments. In this case, it is number two, number three, and number four. And then this means you will have a latency of 14 seconds because you are going to play uh, from second uh, four. You are at second 18, 18 minus four, 14 seconds of latency. But you are going to have 12 seconds of content in your playback buffer. That's the native HLS Apple devices do. The second option is fetch the last full available segment, looking at the manifest or the playlist. In this case, it's segment number four, because segment number five is still being prepared, encoded, and packaged, so it's not available. And you ask for it. In this case, you are going to get a latency of six seconds, so it's much lower latency. But then your buffered media is also lower, four seconds. And then if you defer the request, which, uh, uh, which is uh, also one of the options, but I haven't seen really any player doing this, you know that the number five, segment number five is going to be available very soon. So you defer the request. Instead of asking for number four, you ask, uh, you wait, and then you ask for number five. As soon as it's available, you ask for it, and then you get it. In this case, your latency is going to be the lowest, four seconds, which is your segment duration. Uh, your buffer duration uh, is also going to be four seconds. So this seems to be like a better deal, but I haven't seen any player doing that because perfect synchronization, like sending a request right before, right after the segment became available is a tricky business. We can talk about it later. The low latency extensions for Dash and then similarly for HLS makes use of a technology called chunking. So instead of generating one full four second segment, you might want to produce that segment in smaller pieces. So by producing them in smaller pieces and making them available for delivery, in this case, uh, move and M dot boxes, CMF uh, uh, chunks, you can actually cut down the segment, uh, uh, you can decouple the segment duration from the latency. So instead of waiting for the entire segment to be available after four seconds, 120 frames, I make uh, here, uh, for every three frame, I produce uh, a, a CMF chunk, and then I just ship them out. And then the clients can actually start downloading this. And then this makes it uh, decouple uh, uh, the latency from segment duration. And then here we are stuck with the chunk duration, but chunk duration could be as small as a one frame duration. So here I'm going to show how it works. Here, instead of uh, four second segments, uh, we still have four second segments, but there are one second chunks in it. And instead of uh, asking for five segment uh, fully, uh, you know, I'm gonna ask segment number five, but before it is fully available, so I'm gonna get A and B right away, and then C and D once they become available. So this reduces the latency and uh, makes the playback faster. This is essentially how low, low latency dash works and low latency HLS works. Low latency dash and HLS uh, differ in one uh, major point. Uh, low latency dash still uses HTTP 1.1 conditional uh, 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 chunk transfer encoding, conditional get. Um, so the, the chunks are being post 
hosted on the origin server, and then there is a, a CT get message coming from the client to the CDN, from the CDN to the origin, and the chunks are being transferred, right? So CT needs to be enabled by the CDN and the origin server to make this happen. H HLS, low latency HLS doesn't use this. It uses HTTP2 uh, streaming mode, and uh, uh, it has some uh, other, unfortunately, some requirements that, uh, that, that you need to support on the origin server. We can talk about those later as well. So what is mock? So that's essentially what the HHLS uh, does in terms of uh, low latency and what is, what is mock. Media were quick transport. The initial name was Media were quick. Later on, we decided to make it more like a transport layer protocol. So we call it Media were quick transport now. It is whole, the whole purpose is low latency because the world now lives in a where, you know, Dash and HLS gives you a perfect solution for high latency applications. And then you have WebRTC on the other scale of the uh, latency paradigm where, you know, sub-second latency is do easily doable. And uh, somewhere in the middle, you know, that's where most of the struggle is. And that's why low latency here is referring to second, around second, you know, sub-second type of latency. We are not talking about near real time over here. But the nice thing about Medieval Quick is it's latency tunable. So it is not, I mean, this is one of the biggest differences from WebRTC where you really need everything right away. Like you need to really live at the live edge. But Medieval Quick Transport gives you the capability to adjust the latency. And depending on the latency, you can do retransmissions, forward error correction, or other type of magical stuff to recover from packet loss, for example. It's a pops up model. So there is a publisher. Uh, there could be one, more than one publisher, audio publisher, video publisher. And then there are subscribers, like the clients, and then relay points where the replication happens. So that this is just like multicast fan out or HTTP caching, OK? And then between each point, we have a web transport session, or we have a raw quick session uh, that will carry the media over quick objects. So it is uh, cache friendly just like Dash HLS is, and uh, unlike WebRTC is. And uh, it is, uh, <clears throat> uh, it's supposed to support all kinds of media. For example, our implementation is CMF compatible carrying MP4 uh, packaged content. But then you can do elementary streams and other stuff as well. So UDP is responsible for the transmission of the bits. It's the plain vanilla. Uh, you know, uh, transport layer, which Quick uses. On top of that, we have Web Transport and Quick, which are specified by different working groups in the ITF, and they are, Quick is done, but Web Transport is still work in progress, but if you use Chrome, it is supported. It is responsible for packet loss recovery, congestion control, and stream management. There are multiple streams in a single Quick connection, that's what stream management is all about. And then Mock Transport, that's where the sexy stuff happens. So pops up protocol, session uh, management, object model, catalog, prioritization, differential drop, selective forwarding, all kinds of interesting stuff happens here. And this is what we are working on right now. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples. And then on top of that, we have the streaming formats. And uh, that's uh, really, you know, if you have CMF content, how do I actually map everything to mod media or quick uh, transport objects and so on? You know, those kinds of questions. So. Okay, this is joke number one. Uh, this is regular people drinking water and uh, be, you know TCP and Quick. This is how they behave. So Dash HLS, that's all. They also use TCP underneath, as you can imagine. If, you are, if they are running under uh, HTTP3 environment, then they will use Quick. But Quick uses UDP, I understand, as you know. But then it's still congestion controlled and uh, uh, flow controlled when you are using Quick streams. And this is what WebRTC people do. <laughs> they don't know even how to drink water. So uh, there is no flow of control, basically. There is no congestion control. There is sender side rate control, yes, but not necessarily uh, congestion control in every WebRTC application. Now, in Quick, we, can, we also have the datagram mode, which is running on top of UDP, so there is no reliability. And, uh, but it is still congestion controlled. That's one major difference. It is not flow controlled, but it is congestion controlled. So anything you do in Quick is congestion controlled, which is something IETF really loves. So 
when we look at the latency paradigms, uh, you know, uh, this is just a classification uh, I have done. Uh, not everybody agrees to it, but uh, still it's just uh, one, uh, you know, one way of showing things. So there is near real-time latency, ultra-low latency, low latency, typical latency, high latency. And uh, these are the boundaries I picked. Okay, obviously, we can discuss for about the numbers forever. But this is usually what Dash and HLS is good for. Typical latency and high latency applications, they can use Dash HLS without any problem. And we have been doing that for about 15 years. For low latency, between one and 10 seconds, you need low latency extensions, right? And then obviously one second is doable, but it's very fragile. Uh, it, you might get a lot of stalls all the time uh, because of the way Dash HLS works. You know, uh, they depend on reliability, uh, right? If there is a data missing, and then you are going to get a stall. Um, so that that might uh, that might happen quite often. For WebRTC, obviously, you know, we have real-time applications and then ultra-low latency applications, and then somewhere over there, I think that there is a little gap, and that's where, where we are trying to fit the media over quick transport to. Um, uh, so, I mean. I'm not really trying to kid, but this is essentially where the use cases, main use cases for media over quick transport came from. But eventually, once we started working on this, this is job number two. <laughs> uh, I mean, our intention is not to replace everything, but I have a dream where, you know, if you have a single transport layer protocol that can address all the media use cases in one shot. So I don't need the HLS protocol stack and then a dash HLS HTTP CDN for large scale media distribution, and then another CDN or set of FSU, uh, S -S -F -Us, uh, to, you know, uh, deliver my real time media. I would like to have a single media or quick transport CDN that can do actually both of them at the same time. So whether that's going to happen or not, obviously time will tell. But that's the ambition of this working group. So unifying real-time communications and content delivery. On one hand, we have Dash HLS with great scalability, but not so much interactivity. On the other hand, we have real-time applications uh, with uh, really low latency, but not so much scalability. So we would like to mix both words at the same time. So one result that we have uh, published in our IBC paper, actually, anybody going to IBC from here? All right, then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm flying out tomorrow as well. So uh, this, this was our paper last year. So this is something we have sh showed uh, in our paper. So on-time delivery rate, success rate. So we would like to be at 100%, right? And then we would like to be uh, at the lowest uh, latency possible. So as my latency budget goes up, my success rate is going to be 100%. That's obvious. Right, and TCP is going to achieve a curve like this. You know, it is not. Uh, it's for illustration purposes, not necessarily representative, but uh, something we have shown. You know, a similar curve in our study as well. And this is what Quick does, or is at least capable of. So, at a lower latency budget, our success rate is going to be higher. Or to achieve the same success rate, let's say quality. You know, I can. I can, uh, I can use a lower latency budget. So that's, that's the goal. If Quick doesn't give us this uh, feature, then why should we actually invest our money and time on it, right? So this is where Quick beats TCP. And the larger the yellow area is, the bigger the improvements are. So here are some uh, numbers from uh, um, you know, uh, Akamai, you know, in terms of how much HTTP3 which is based on Quick has been used in their in their network. This is from June, actually, a couple of months old data. And then, as you can see, still most requests coming to Akamai CDN, which is the largest CDN in the world, still HTTP 1.1, and then uh, one third is about HTTP 2. Only one quarter is HTTP 3, but most of the bytes are still carried over HTTP 1, which means video is still being carried over HTTP 1.1. When you look at the throughput and the request turnaround times, throughput for the HTTP3 is a bit worse than the other uh, protocols because these are really 
optimized implementations over the years. HTTP3 just came out a couple of years ago, right? So it's just being developed and uh, deployed. And request run turnaround times is just a bit better for HTTP3 for the quick establishment and that sort of thing, but not by a large margin. Now, looking at this, people might say, why don't you just use dash HLS over HTTP3 and then get all the benefits of quick? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't really work that way. Uh, dash and HLS, they depend on the reliability, like in order delivery of the data stream. If quick, if you program quick to be, uh, to run like that, you are going to be using a single stream quick and it's gonna behave just like TCP. It's not gonna be any different. If you want the quick's feature, uh, unique features like prioritization, selective forwarding, you know, uh, selective reset, that's all, those are those are features. You need to make sure that you run, your application understands those, um, uh, you know, those features. And none of the existing Dash HLS applications unfortunately understand that. And that's why we have shown in our paper that, you know, uh, to, if you do this, you have a great potential. But until you do that, Nothing is going to improve just because you switch to HTTP3. Quick is like a multi-lane highway, so because there are multiple streams in a single quick connection, in a single connection, and each lane ca can carry specific data in a different priority with a different priority, which is something uh, not uh, uh, provided by TCP. So, as an example here, when there is no congestion, obviously prioritization doesn't really mean much, right? The ambulance is going just fine, the trucks are going just fine, the motorcycles are going just fine. But uh, when there is congestion, unfortunately the traffic slows down and the ambulance is stuck, the motorcycles are stuck and uh, traffic just simply doesn't move. Obviously in traffic we don't really get packet loss, but in networks there will be packet loss and there will be more trouble. Now, the only way to deal with this is we need to relieve the congestion. And if we are under low latency requirements, we have only very limited amount of time to react to the congestion. We need to reduce our transmission rate, which is obviously what any normal person do. WebRTC uh, does that same thing, right? Bandwidth estimation on the center side so that you adjust your encoder bitrate and so on. And, uh, or you start dropping some stuff on the SFE, for example, so that uh, you relieve the congestion. And this is where quick priorities come into play. So if I play my cards carefully with the you know, priority cards carefully, I can actually make a big improvement in my video quality. So I'm gonna show you an example here. So let's uh, prioritize important stuff when we, are, uh, when we are under congestion. So there are three lanes here. This is high priority stream, this is low medium priority stream, this is low priority stream. And then if I don't have enough bandwidth, I can just get rid of the low priority stream. I want to make sure that the ambulance and the motorcycles, motorcycles are denoting the audio packets here uh, because they are smaller in size and so on. Uh, I want to make sure that they arrive on time. Low, you know, the, the fat big video frames, some of them can be dropped, so I can just get rid of them. And then with Quick, I have this capability. Or again, less, less uh, send less stuff, which is equivalent to dropping least important stuff. So I got rid of the trucks, the buses, heavy vehicles, and then the traffic just flows without any uh, prioritization. So I have, a, I have a slide here that will uh, eventually, hopefully will make you think about what Dash and uh, Media Work Quick can do. So, anybody remembers this guy? Right, blue pill versus red pill. Uh, there is no pill for a WebRTC, apologies for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, you need to pick, how many people would pick the blue pill? Does anybody remember what blue pill stands for? Is the reality or the? Well, matrix. matrix, right? Yeah, so the reality is medium were quick this time, all right. So this is what we did. Uh, we demoed this uh, uh, earlier uh, this year in an ACM conference. We have, a we have a live camera. You can actually download the entire code and play it yourself. We have FFmpeg instances, mock pub for the uh, mock uh, origin, and a mock relay, which is a relay implementation and mock player. 
and then we have origin GS uh, for the dash origin HTTP origin, and then dash GS the reference player, and then we have a cockpit UI where we record all the metrics. You can uh, visualize everything in real time. So we have a dash pipeline and mock T pipeline where we we, comp we can comp make any comparison that we would like to. Eventually, a lot of uh, features are still missing, but you know we are getting there. If you go to moq.streaminguniversity, this is what you are going to see. You are going to click on the mock player. It's going to show up this one. You are going to click on the dash link. It's going to open that one. And then you are going to see a live feed, hopefully. Uh, I just worked. It was, it was working a couple of minutes ago. And then you can do a couple of things over here. You can enable ABR, adaptive bitrate, adaptive rate shifting, based on the uh, bitrate that you uh, select to apply. You can apply different latency budgets. budgets. So that you know, I want one second latency, or I want to be at the live edge. So you see how uh, the, each player actually reacts to, you know, uh, bottleneck uh, bandwidth bottlenecks. So <clears throat> an important part of our research of my students is bandwidth measurements. Uh, this has been discussed a few times uh, yesterday and today, and I would like to say a couple of words over here. So web. WebRTC and most WebRTC-like applications do sender-side bandwidth estimates. They try to understand uh, how much data they can send per second on the sender side. And uh, that's fine. But here, since we are mostly a client-driven system, we would like to actually understand how much data the sender can send us to us so that we can actually report it back and we can pick the representation we want. So this is a client-driven quality selection, client-driven ABR, or client-driven uh, quality adaptation, whatever you want to call it, right? So there is HD, there is 4K, there is ST, or different resolutions, and the client decides based on the data that it receives, it says, I want this, I want that, or I want this, right? So we have passive and active measurement, different types of measurements on the client side. We collect raw samples. This is all happening in real time, obviously. Uh, we have a smoothing process. There are different ways of smooth data, weighted or windowed. And we also use sender-side signals. So with each data, we are actually getting some auxiliary information from the sender in terms of its uh, uh, transport layer metrics so that we can incorporate that data into the bandwidth measurement tool. And then we have the smoothed values. And this is very important. We have a prediction step. If you, you just use the smoothed value, you are going to be using just the measured bandwidth as your predicted value. But if you have a good prediction model, which is something we are working on, uh, and that they are learning based, you can actually do a bit better. And then you can try to predict the bandwidth into the future, at least for the next few seconds. And this gives us a lot of improvement in terms of rate adaptation. So just as, a, as an example here, this is a bandwidth regime that we applied to the MOCT client. We drop the bandwidth regularly from 20 megabits to down to 2 megabits per, per second, and then increase back to uh, 14 megabits per second. And this is, uh, this is the measured bandwidth, the yellow line. Obviously, there are cases where it actually failed. It overestimated the bandwidth or overmeasured the bandwidth. Sometimes in a few places, it underestimated the bandwidth. But overall, it's not a really uh, bad tool. This is just using uh, client-side packet dispersion. So looking at how the packets are dispersed at the reception side, we un try to understand the bandwidth measurement. If we add on top of that active bandwidth measurements, which is like probing, we send some probing uh, traffic, you know, a similar bandwidth regime, this is what we get. So this is also uh, performing very well, but the disadvantage is that obviously we are using a bit more uh, overhead in this case. Especially in during congested time, this will be a big problem, but with prioritization, we can always make this low priority so that it will not affect the high priority traffic. So when we look at the ongoing research, available bandwidth, which is really important for your rate adaptation, can be measured on the client side in a passive or active way. Passive measurements have several advantages. As I said, no traffic overhead, no additional track, no additional media over quick track or track management issue, and no need to find a good value for the pro, you know, probing size. 
uh, whereas you need to find that value for the active measurements. Uh, but the nice thing about uh, active measurements is that sometimes the traffic just stops from the sender side for whatever reason. And then if you are not receiving anything, how could you measure the bandwidth, right? In that case, probing helps too. And uh, active measurements, they also work more reliably when there's not you know, uh, sufficient data coming in, which is maybe as low as uh, no data coming in uh, in the network. So center side signals can assist the client side measurements, but they should really shouldn't replace them. This is something, this is a discussion I'm really trying to fight in the ITF right now. A lot of people think that you know center side is the king. It knows everything and it should know everything. It shouldn't really ask the client uh, what to do, but I simply disagree with that statement. A couple of results over here. Uh, I know that I'm over time, but I have the luxury of being uh, the last speaker. <laughs> so uh, let me just show the data. So again, we applied a certain bandwidth uh, regime and then mock T on the left-hand side and then the uh, dash on the right-hand side. If you look at the results just from a video quality perspective, they are not, either of them is not very good. In this case, the target latency is five seconds. So for mock, it's a huge buffer. For dash, it's really, you know, okay, buffer, low latency dash, you know, it can deal with five seconds, but as you can see, you know, it adapts well, it doesn't really adapt here, it probably has a stall, it uh, downshifts and then upshifts again, and it is scared of upshifting again, right? Red, red adaptation obviously is not an exact science, but that's what it can do. Now for the mock t which is not really optimized for this kind of latency, it upshifts, and then downshifts, and then upshifts, but doesn't really upshift to the next level. If you look at the target latency of one, uh, one second case, <coughs> same experiment. Oops. You are gonna see that actually Mokti is doing a better job. It's still doing as good a job, and the dash, uh, dash play is actually it really sucks in this case because it's, it doesn't really know how to deal with one second latency. So it just downshifts and stays there. So there is some promising potential in the mock over T, but there is also some potential improvement that we would like to further explore. And then hopefully uh, with uh, active uh, research, uh, we will get there. And uh, in case anybody is interested in streaming stuff, uh, especially low latency live streaming stuff, here is a um, survey paper that we wrote, you know, it's uh, about 40 pages, it's a very long paper with about uh, 250 references. Uh, you might want to download it just, you know, have as, as a reference if you would like to read it at some point. So that's my last slide. And I'm trying to dodge the questions here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ali. Does anyone have any questions? Lorenz. <laughs> and I forgot to mention those are my students, uh, so the, the work belongs to them. A good point about the fact that just putting a dash on top of HTTP3 doesn't really get you anything because you don't you don't yeah. go around the head of line blocking that exactly. the single stream has. <laughs> But are you aware of any effort happening within Dash to try and circumvent this by using multi-stream, or is this not happening? Yes, we, uh, we have an active uh, work item in Dash JS uh, reference player that we would like to try that, and uh, we would like to, uh, you know, uh, uh, put uh, put that player onto on steroids so that it can actually perform better with uh, with HTTP three. Yes, Thank but uh, we haven't done it yet. It's an active development. We have a question over here. Yeah. Um, oh. Yeah, so I really like actually the part of the congestion control, especially the results, but I am very curious about other measurements, like uh, how it will coexist with HTTP uh, short-term traffic, like HTTP2 traffic, how it will compete with it, 
basically how it will coexist the quick and the mock tree. Yeah, good question. <laughs> 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 uh, they are on our to-do list. I mean, there are, I think, if I remember well, there are seven uh, criteria for the um, RTP congestion control when well, for the testing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, in order to see how it will behave, we need to know that. Yeah, well, those are really good questions, and uh, those are on, on our, uh, our to-do list. Definitely. All right. That's super great. Yeah. I might be back next year. So. <laughs> it's about the... Yeah, yeah, it's working. Uh, the the last graph. Have you like done the same thing with WebRTC and see whether you see whether this one? So the <laughs> oh, not this one. Uh, the, 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 that one. So have you tried doing that with WebRTC to see whether it like as a as a goal? Well, we should we should do that. We haven't done it yet. We should do that. I mean, I knew that uh, you know there will be a lot of WebRTC people here, and you know, uh, and, uh, I tried to keep, I tried to uh, keep myself to more more on the streaming side as much as possible, uh, because uh, we feel at least more comfortable with our results and uh, with our testing scenarios. But definitely, I mean, uh, if if we if we if we argue that mock transport is the protocol that will replace everything. It's going to be the ultimate MIDI protocol that obviously we need to do those tests as well. All right. There is, oh, there are more questions. Uh, sure. Go ahead. All right. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So I think the top scenario that comes to my mind when ultra low latency really matters is when you need some interaction from the receiver as well, such right. as potential live sports betting, where you know you need to basically show yeah. the people like near real-time latency. Correct. Besides that, is there anything that you're thinking of that can only deal with the data, such as, um, such as day trading, for example, where you need to you know, update the stock value like almost in near real-time? So are there any other user scenarios that are coming to your mind besides the media? Besides the media? Right. Uh, I haven't really thought about that much. I mean, uh, all the use cases I have in my mind, they are all related to media. Like drone control, you know, uh, remote surgery, you know, that sort of thing. They are all related somehow to media, but uh, I'm pretty sure there are some other non-media use cases. But then, in, in in those cases, if the data is not really that large, I mean, uh, we have great protocols to transmit that data in uh, in a very short amount of time. So, I believe that yes. Thank you for the presentation. And sure. at the beginning, you said that this protocol is as cash friendly, or, th or at least yeah. aims to be as cash friendly as yeah. uh, HLS or other protocols. And I wanted to ask you if you could expand it a little bit more. Uh, right. So the relay, uh, the relays. Uh, let me go back to the pr one of the early slides. Over here, the relays are supposed to cache the mediocre quick transport objects. And then whenever, whenever, whenever there's a request for it again from downstream, they will be able to replace, simply send it before sending the request back to the publisher. So it's going to be more like an HTTP cache response. So it's a cache hit, and then you just uh, res respond directly. So this guy is, for example, asking for your video in HD quality to relay and has it. It will send it to you right away. It doesn't need to send a request back to the publisher and then send it back from upstream. So it's going to work pretty much like HTTP. Okay, thanks. Sure. Would you mind passing the mic over there? Because I think that we have uh, another question. Oh, Wojtek has a Prior, mic. Prior, like okay. the separate handling in CDNs, right? Uh, you will, the, the caching. Uh, you couldn't use the already existing CDNs. No, we, we can't. We right. can't. But uh, that's why, uh, the, in, you know, in this work, if you, if you go to the Media or Quick uh, working group, you will see that a uh, bunch of companies are interested in this work. And uh, some of them have their own CDNs, like Google and Meta. And uh, Akamai is another interested player, and uh, it's a CDN company. So hopefully we can expect some early implementations in the next few years. Uh, okay, yeah. a question, uh, because in this case, uh, the, there must be possible direct uh, connection between publisher and subscriber. 
and sometimes it is not possible or you have uh, multiple possible paths. And in case of uh, WebRTC, there is an ICE uh, together with Terms which allows to select the best path, either direct or relayed via Tern servers. And uh, my question is, do you know if there is any work in progress to adapt these uh, mechanisms to Moku? I, I really don't know specifically, but uh, one thing definitely is that you need to have uh, support for is uh, if the quake is uh, blocked by the network itself, uh, unfortunately, nothing is going to work anyway. Right? Uh, so yes, yeah. uh, but uh, in some cases, uh, you want to have peer-to-peer -peer connections. Uh, both peers may be behind nuts, so direct yeah. connection is not possible. And uh, right. the right. server allows to establish the, the this connection in this case. I suppose in that case, you will need a stun ice like a storage solution to actually make the initial connection. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. But uh, I wonder if this is somehow standardized that we should do in this way or this way, no, that no, way. No, no, not at the moment. Not at the moment. Ah. Okay, thanks. Sure. Yes, then. Will Meteor Overquick take 10 years to standardize I like hope not. RTC took? I hope not. I hope so, too. <laughs> You hope so? Or? I, no, no, I, I hope that it won't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just to be sure. I mean, the intention of the working group is that, I mean, uh, I mean, these are not the same WebRTC people uh, as uh, they are working in the Media World Quick working group, but some of them are, and they know that it, it was really a painful process to finish WebRTC in such a long time. So I think they learned their lesson, so they want to be able to ship something as quickly as possible. I, I hope near real time doesn't get dropped from V1 um, because we'll never, so, we'll, we'll, so we'll never get back to the I dream. So right. I hope so too. Yeah. I hope so too. All right. Unless there are any further questions. Oh, there is a question. Okay, so uh, could you could, could you please uh, go back to the slide with uh, drinking water? <laughs> the, the <laughs> one, the <laughs> All right. Yes. So don't you think that WebRTC is still a more fun thing to do? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on whether you are the guy holding the pipe <laughs> <laughs> or the other poor guy. <laughs> I mean, literally, right? If you are the receiver, it doesn't look as much fun as uh, as the sender side. We can discuss this on after party, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think that That's we are it. ending on a high note. So thank you very much, Ali.